Hi everyone. Um, today we will be um, discussing a bit about uh, transcriptomics and how to do RNA set data analysis um, using Galaxy. Um, this is going to be a very short introduction on transcriptomics so that we can um, identify a few of the basic concepts before we move on to the hands-on part of the day. Um, before going through the details here, uh, which you can find um, in the Galaxy training um, page, um, it would be nice also to have an introduction to, uh, to the Galaxy analysis, how it works, uh, and also how to do overall sequence analysis. Um, and there are very, some very good slides about quality control and mapping that you can find there. So um, first and foremost, a key question to address is what is actually RNA sequencing? And uh, for this, uh, we'll first do a quick introduction about what RNA is. This might be uh, a lot of, uh, this, this might be very familiar to, to a lot of you. Uh, so I'll just give a, a very brief context here. Um, so if you look at, at the DNA at this level, um, what you actually have are a lot of different parts that comprise a gene. You might have enhancers, promoters, you have the main part of the gene and the open reading frame of the part, which actually leads to the protein, and you have additional elements um, on the right and the and left side of, of the gene. So the transcription uh, transforms your DNA into, the, um, into an mRNA, into the post transcription notification part. Um, which actually comprises only of the exon parts and the intron parts of the gene. So the rest of the area around the gene is, is cut off, if you like, and the main part is left here, the red parts. Uh, the post transcription modification of the mRNA leads to the mature mRNA, and um, this contains only the exon parts. The intron parts, the gray parts of the gene are being cut off, and only the protein coding region of the mRNA is being kept. This part is what can be costly translated into a protein, which, um, which um, does the whole process. In any case, RNA is um, in a nutshell the transcribed form of the DNA and is what it can be used uh, to um, produce a protein that will do um, the activities within, within yourself later on. Uh, when we talk about RNA sequencing, it's basically the part where we take the mRNA and we try to quantify it. Um, what it achieves, it has a RNA quantification at a single base resolution. So starting from the whole DNA, as we said earlier, and we have the pre-mRNA when we're talking about the mRNA part, this is what is being um, retrieved during the in vivo process of RNA sequence, during the library prep. This is, going, this is constantly um, fragmented into RNA fragments, uh, reverse transcription takes place, and um, the cDNA that is produced is usually sequenced through high throughput sequences, and what you, this is uh, the part that you actually get at the end. Um, so the RNA sequencing part, the RNA sequencing process is a cost-efficient way to analyze um, the whole of the transcriptome of, of a particular uh, cell or a particular sample in a high throughput manner. So if you look at, uh, at the process in a bit more detail um, in asking where your data is actually coming from, um, this is where you take your cells, you extract the RNA, and um, depending on where you're talking about the mRNA or the small RNA, you have different process. In all those cases, uh, eventually what you end up being is a library where you have the fragments of the RNA um, listed here, and these are going to be sequenced, and um, the sequence part is what you get as, as an input of, of your data. So moving away from, from, the, um, from the biology part and going directly to the RNA sequencing. So what is the main principle of RNA sequencing? And this is one of my favorite um, uh, comic strips, if you like. Um, so you have the, the science here, so asking, so I want to, to do a transcript of everything that I have, all the different cells that I have in my, my samples or different samples. So what it actually happens is you have the transcriptome and you basically shred it. You have your mRNA fragmented into a million, literally, or even hundreds of millions, billions of different small pieces. 
And what you get from the machine, from the sequencing, is um, this whole mess of, of, of colored strips. The RNA sequencing bioinformatics approach, the computational approach here, is to take all those shredded pieces of paper and try to reconstruct the original red piece of paper. Um, and as you can imagine, because it's definitely not an easy process, it has a few, um, it might have a few mismatches here and there, which means that what you get at the end um, might have some inconsistencies some of these yellow and, and blue parts in, in the red area. So um, part of the computational process is also to ensure that such errors are identified and how to, to keep them in mind at least. So um, what are the actual challenges of RNA sequencing? So three, there are three main points. So the first is that um, when you do the, uh, the sequencing, um, what you have as a sample uh, might be completely different or have some very notable difference with what is the reference genome what, that we will be using um, to create um, the mapping and to quantify in those RNA sequences. Uh, the second part um, might be noise. So in other words, uh, you might not have a clean um, uh, extraction of your RNA. You might have additional information here, fragments of pieces of information of RNA um, that are present when you do this process and are consequently sequenced. And finally, um, this is all a bit of a chemistry, uh, which means that there might be some sequencing biases, so some PCR uh, over amplification or errors or anything else that comes into place when doing the preparation part. So all of those are challenges that need to be, uh, one needs to be aware uh, before doing the actual RNA-seq analysis. But beyond the challenges, there are also a lot of benefits. And um, the main one is that I mentioned earlier, it's cost efficient and it's high throughput. And it allows us to identify a lot of, to get a lot of information in a relatively short um, time and a bit um, with, with low enough cost. Um, it allows us to have a very good understanding of, of the quantities of RNA uh, that exist in, in a particular sample um, to identify uh, splicing points, and novel transcripts, gene fusions, and all in all to have a better understanding of, of what is happening at the molecular level. So if you look at the actual questions that are being addressed using RNA-seq, you have two main applications, if you like. So the one is um, addressing the question of what are the actual RNA molecules that I have in my particular sample? So this is the transcript discovery part. Um, in this case, the primary goal of RNA-seq is to identify uh, novel isoforms, identify alternative splicing points, fusion genes, uh, potential circular single nucleotide variations, and, and so forth. So the main focus here is to identify um, and annotate the RNA molecules that you find. The second question is, um, what are what is the concentration of the different um, RNA molecules in, in my sample? So here, the particular point is to quantify RNA. And um, we either aim for an absolute gene expression. So if we look within the particular sample, we want to make to uh, understand what are the differences in the gene expression between different genes, for example. Or if you're looking between different samples or different groups of samples, what is the differential expression of genes there? So these are the two main applications for RNA sec. What we are going to be doing, we are going to be seeing mostly the RNA quantification part, uh, but at some times I'll be highlighting how um, the transit discovery can also be applied in the same context. So how to analyze RNA sec using um, aiming for RNA quantification. So roughly the process is as follows. What you get from the sequencing is basically a lot of <clears throat> fragments of, um, of, of, of the different molecules. And after you sequence those, you try to map them onto a particular genome. And you have those black lines here corresponding to each region. And you might identify cases here 
um, that some part of a particular um, read is mapped into a particular gene or a particular exon of a gene, and another part of the same read being mapped to, that, to a different part. I will be covering this in a, in, a, in, a, in a moment. But eventually what you do is you map your reads onto a reference, a genome in this instance, and then you start counting and you start to count how many reads or how many layers in this instance of a particular gene you find. So for example, the purple gene here, you find basically one layer of that. Um, in the yellow one, you find one, two, three, or two if you, uh, if you see this as, as straight lines. And this in, in, in the blue one here, you have one, two, three. So quantifying how many layers of reads you have on the particular gene is one way of quantifying. There are different ways, and I'll, I'll hopefully I'll, I'll address a few of them here. So the data processing um, pipeline is basically those um, five steps. So you have um, basically a set of reads, either single end, so only the forward part, or forward and reverse, so you have parent, and you have multiple sets of reads for multiple samples for the control, for example, and for the treatment. Um, although there is no standardized workflow for RNA-seq, like a gold standard that everyone uses, there are different, there's a lot of best practices and um, some standard ideas that can be used for every data set. And these are basically the steps that are correspond to them. So after you get these, um, these files from, from the sequencing uh, facility, the first thing is to do is to do some basically quality control. Uh, this is already covered in, in, a, in a different um, lesson in Galaxy. You've already seen this on, 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 on yesterday, on day one of this, uh, of this event. So I will not be covering this in more detail. And then after mapping into a reference genome, you get some annotation and given some information about how your transcripts are uh, matching to particular pieces of information like genes, you can do a recounting. And eventually from this process, what you get is for every one of those samples, you have a count table. Having those multiple tables at the end per group, for example, you can apply different questions. And one of them, one of the most common one is to do differential expression analysis. Um, if you look at the data pre-processing, so the part right here, um, this is a, <clears throat> a single step where you try to refine your data and to ensure that whatever information comes from there onwards, <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, is clear enough and it minimizes um, the noise and any potential errors that may come in from the sequencing part. So the first is to do some adapter clipping. So if there are any adapters from the sequence that have been left over, this is a good step to actually remove them. And also to do some quality assessment. So if there are any um, low quality reads or um, low quality bases, um, you can also remove them or trim them depending on the size that you're going to be using. The key part, and this is one that I will um, focus a bit more, is how to do the annotation of this RNA secret. So you have a lot of different fragments, these small black lines. And the question is, okay, how can we figure out how those, where those came from, um, from our reference genome? So it's, it's basically a mapping process, but it's not an always straightforward or easy approach. So keep in mind, that what we have as input is basically um, fragments of this mRNA, of this whole orange um, piece of information. But if we try to map this onto the reference genome, you actually have a bit of, of blanks, if you like. So black areas, these introns that have been removed when sequencing the mRNA. So if we map those reads to the mRNA, you expect something like that, that everything is going to be mapped across the entire um, sequence of the transcript. However, if you try to do this onto your um, genome, you might have cases, those highlight like in red here, that are basically between two different exons that if you map them on the genome level, they appear as to have a gap. So one part of the read is in one exon, then you have a big gap, which corresponds to the intron, and the second part of the same read is mapped to the next exon. So this is 
a useful piece of information. This is a challenge and one of the challenges that the underliners and different mappers need to, to address. Uh, but it's something to always consider, especially if you are thinking about identifying novel transcripts, alternative splicing points, fusion genes, and so forth. This is one way that those things can be identified. So if you look at the mapping, and, and going back to, to this particular process, there are three main ways of, of dealing with that. So the first approach is to map directly to the transcriptome. So having this particular piece of information, the transcript itself, uh, we map our reads directly here. So this is straightforward. The second strategy is to map to the genome. So if we don't have, or we don't want to use a transcriptome, the second way is to map those reads into the genome itself, again, with the challenge that we've identified earlier. A third strategy is to do a de novo assembly. So take the reads and try to reconstruct a transcriptome and try to use this one uh, as a means of counting. I'll go through those in a bit, um, also a bit more detail. Um, going for the transcriptome mapping, this is the easiest one to, to achieve because this is what you have as transcript. You have basically action one, action two, action three for a particular transcript. And what you do, you take your reads, you clearly align them to, uh, to the transcriptome, and you, even if it's a pair end, you can see how they can be aligned to different parts. So this is easy enough to achieve, but it has two main disadvantages, if you like. The one is that you really need to have reliable gene models. So what you use as a reference for transcriptome need to be reliable enough. There exists for, for um, a lot of the reference organs, reference species out there. Um, but if you're working with a not so common species, that might be something um, a bit more difficult to achieve. Also, if you want to detect novel genes, um, this is not possible to do because what you're doing here is you are aligning your reads to your existing transcripts, so known, already known transcripts of genes. So novel genes, novel isoforms are not going to be identified through this process. Um, as the second strategy, as I said, was to use genome mapping. So in this case, this is a bit more um, difficult to achieve, more challenging. Um, and as I said, if you have a parent read, the first one would be easy, for example, to align this instance because it's completely mapped on the exon side, uh, on, on exon one. But the second read um, actually um, spans three exons. It's a bit of exon one, the entire of exon two, and a, a little bit of exon three. So this one would be a bit harder to align, but it has a very distinct advantage that you are able to identify splicing points and also to detect potentially new genes and new isoforms. So this is um, the advantage of genome mapping. So um, both of them, as you can understand, have a very common um, theme. In both cases, you require a high quality reference genome or reference transcriptome uh, ideally in a FASTA format. And um, in order to have a good annotation of the, of, the, of the regions of this reference genome or transcription, you need to have also the annotation of these known genes. Again, usually in, in a GTF file format, um, but there are additional formats that are equally compatible here. Um, both those um, pieces of information are relatively easy enough to find uh, especially if you are aiming for um, you mostly studied organs like human, mouse, and so forth, and some sort of uh, some projects and organizations that actually produce and maintaining annotations on that include AMBL ABI, UCSC, RefSec, Ensemble, and so forth. So you can look into these projects and organizations and and, and retrieve those um, those files. Um, so if None, none of those two strategies work for you, or if you don't have a reference genome or you don't need one, then the third strategy is the one that is um, the one that might work. So in this case, what you do is you assemble your reads into transcript, you do a de novo assembly into transcript, and then whatever is produced, you use it, this as a reference to map your reads back and actually do the quantification. 
if you aim only at identifying the transcript, so putting together the list of the individual uh, molecules that you found, this uh, step one is sufficient. But if you want to do a quantification as well, which is our goal here uh, for this particular introduction, um, then you need to map your original reads back to your transcript so you can have a quantification of its read to the transcript itself. So um, these are the strategies of the mapping part. Um, the next step, if you've done the mapping, is to actually do the quantification, which is, again, addressing the question of what is the expression level of the genomic features that we're looking for. So if we want to count the number of reads per feature, that is relatively easy. If we have the features and we have them mapped, we count them um, uh, depending on how they are structured. But there are also a few challenges. So the first um, is the one that we have um, already touched upon a few times. If we have reads that are uh, mapped into multiple cases, um, what will happen in this case? So if you have, for example, repeat regions, you might have a read that is um, aligned into multiple cases. So you expect a read to be uh, coming from multiple different regions. So the aligner, the mapper itself, will propose that this particular read can be mapped here and here and here. So how to address this is a, uh, is, is a question that needs to be decided upon uh, during the analysis. Also, a different question is um, if we want to do a quantification of features, how do we want to distinguish the different isoforms, for example? Are we going to do this at the gene level? Are we using the different transcripts, or are we going to do this at the exome level? So all those are different um, questions that need to be um, addressed before doing the quantification, quantification itself. So given that we have the quantification done, and we're going to be seeing a few tools in the hands-on later um, in, in this tutorial, uh, we need to move on to the differential expression. So we've done the quantification in a single sample, uh, but we may want to identify what are the differences in the, um, in the numbers, in the, in the concentrations of RNA across different groups, different conditions, or different samples. Um, so essentially, what we are going to be producing per sample is this sort of a distribution, if you like, across the same reference. Um, but then, if we want to do this differential expression analysis, we, we need to account for the variability of expression across both the biological replicates as well as different, um, uh, different technical replicates, again, with the help of the counts. Um, the first step usually is to do normalization. In other words, try to make the expression levels comparable across the different, um, different groups. And there are different ways of doing that. Uh, you can do it by features, and um, you do this at the gene level or the isoform level, for example. Uh, you should do it by samples so that you ensure that all the samples are comparable. Um, and there are multiple methods that achieve that. And every method usually corresponds to a different tool that actually implements this. So there are the FPKM and RPKM methods of, of normalization across different samples. It, there is the TMM method that is um, evident in, in EDSR packets. And there is also the D62 method um, available through the, the same named um, packets in R, uh, which is the most commonly used um, uh, approach. Um, it, it's important to highlight that um, so far, um, the ones that are shown to be the most robust are the DC2 and TMM ones, um, because they are um, more efficient and more robust when you're do, discussing about different library sizes and different compositions of the library. So if you're uh, describing different um, sets of samples, um, then you might, um, TMM and DSIC2 are the, the most uh, relevant ones. Um, and in closing, um, it might be also important to keep in mind that the number of replicates used in um, differential um, uh, gene expression uh, as well as the sequence depth of each individual sample um, are critical aspects and have an effect on, um, on which genes and, and, and how many of those genes are identified as um, differentially expressed, statistically significantly 
expressed. As you can see, this is a, a, a study done um, by uh, Conesa et al. in 2016, and you see how the number of replicates per group and the sequencing depth actually has an impact on the probability of detecting um, a differential expression at the sequencing level of, of 5%. And you, as you can see, uh, by increasing the number of replicates, you significantly increase um, the effect size. And also by having um, a significant um, depth of, of sequencing also increases um, uh, the, 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 the probability of identifying those, those two, um, those differential extract genes. So the, the, the rule of thumb basically is to have at least three biological replicates per group in order to have a sufficient enough power of the statistical analysis that is done um, at the end when you're identifying the uh, differential excess genes. Um, in closing, uh, and after doing the differential expression, um, the next step is usually to do uh, some visualization and there are different visualizations for different parts of, 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 of the process. So for example, if you're looking at the aligned um, reads uh, using the BAM files, which we'll be seeing earlier, you can use the IGV or tracksers to visualize those, um, uh, those aligned reads. And you can also do this as CIMI plots, uh, again, through the IGV or other tools to see how the read coverage along axons and splicing points, um, splice junctions um, look like and, 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 and how they work. Uh, at the end, after having the, com the, 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 the counts, you can also do a more efficient visualization of, of the um, counts and their um, differential and fold chains, for example, um, using packages like Cumberbund, uh, which was designed to connect with cufflinks as part of the Tuxedo pipeline um, a few years ago. So um, there are a lot of tutorials that are available to do that. We will be seeing now um, the RNA-seq uh, pipeline, uh, reference-based RNA-seq pipeline uh, leading up until um, the R part, how to do the analysis of CAMs using R. Um, and um, I would like to acknowledge um, the Galaxy Training Network and particularly Berenice, Anika and Marcus for putting together this particular tutorial. And um, thank you for um, listening to this.